which current star right now do you think that's a young star is a uh, the most overlooked he's not talked about enough man um i mean if we're going young stars i feel like the first one i gotta look at is zion williamson because um it, it was just fresh in my mind i was scrolling through twitter and there was a like you have to remove one of these guys and i think it was lowry Markin and scotty barnes i can't remember the third and then zion and i was like when did Zion end up in this group and not like the top 15 <laughs> to 20 players group? Is it just the injuries? Is it the weight gain? I don't know, but Zion's looked phenomenal over their last 10 or so games. The Pelicans are like eight and two. He's averaging seven assists a game. Um, He's still a very efficient paint scorer. He's leveled up playing like point Zion. Um, I just feel like what he does always has like an asterisk attached to it because of the negative connotations with like his off court stuff, um, his injury history. But I think when he's healthy and playing right now, and he's still clearly like not giving a hundred percent effort until the playoffs. Um, I just feel like he deserves a lot more credit for the type of offensive production he puts together. Cause I, I there's very few players in the league who can shift a defense in the way that he does with his paint scoring. The in season tournament loss for them did irreserv- irreversible mm-hmm. damage to the perception around Zion and the Pelicans mm-hmm. because the way that they are talked about is only when it's somebody like Stephen A talking about Zion's weight uh, or how much, like, you know, Zion is not invested. And nobody really talks about their team at all. Like, it's not, nobody talks about the Pelicans at all. But they are a top six seed in the West. You would think that they were outside the player. They were a team like the Houston Rockets. I think Zion Williamson's a great name because, well, I do think there are some valid concerns around the injury history with him and, you know, trying to keep an eye on the durability that he has. Man, I think when they unleash point Zion, it is one of the most effective offenses in the NBA. And a, a thing that I'm definitely tuning into right now is, what they do with Brandon Ingram eventually, because I know that right now they're yielding good results with Ingram, but I do feel like to fully maximize Zion, you just have to put the ball in his hands more. And that means taking away a player like Ingram who commands so many touches. Yeah, that's an interesting wrinkle because I think both of those guys have a very good off ball game, but it kind of like, I don't know. I wonder if they can unlock it in the way that uh, Middleton and Giannis kind of figured it out. Cause I feel like Mm. at points during like that tenure, um, people would kind of complain about like Middleton isolating too much, or they would say um, Middleton's taking the ball away from Giannis or Giannis isn't a versatile creator. They need to go to Middleton um, down the stretch. And I feel like there was a very big uh, concern there. And then they really unlocked it with the pick and roll. It was like, we're going to have Giannis. We're going to have Middleton setting screens for Giannis for one. We're going to have Giannis setting screens for Middleton. And they kind of unlocked the two man game, especially during that 2021 run, like against Phoenix. The two man game was crazy. And I think if they can, if the Pelicans can find a way to unleash that, they've got everything else in place. Like they have an elite shooter in Trey Murphy. They've got Herb Jones is shooting 44% on threes this season. And he's like maybe the best non big defender in the NBA. Um, I feel like the bigger question mark is Valanchunas because I think he kind of fits like uh, with what they're trying to do. Like, I think he he's really good as a screener for Zion. He's really good on the offensive glass. But I, I do wonder what they would look like either with a more versatile defender like an Evan Mobley type or a stretch five. Like if you're running pick and pop with Zion instead of like kind of just pick and stand there. Um, I wonder if uh, I wonder I, the Valanchunas question mark is in, is a little bit interesting to me. Like, if they had someone like Brooke Lopez, how much would the offense improve? Right. Uh, I have a list of young players here. And I wanted to just to make this list for exercise purposes. You know, what player am I going to take to build around these young players? So uh, Zion is in the middle for me. I have Zion. And let me know if you agree with this. I have Zion over Chet to build around. Yeah, I agree with that. Zion over... Jalen Williams. Yeah, I agree with that. Cade Cunningham. Yeah. Although I will say Cade's looking tough right now. Cade's he is. looking tough right now. He is. He is. I love Cade. Scotty Barnes. Yeah. Franz Wagner. Yep. Evan Mobley. Yep. I think I think it's interesting because I, I, w- 
I wouldn't be surprised if a few of those guys end up being better than Zion, but I think that's a little bit of a different discussion than building around. Like I think Chet and Jalen Williams can both be really good, but I feel like more both of them have more of a complementary skill set. Um, I agree. So I feel like that's where the Zion, Zion wins the argument because Zion's one of those put the ball in his hands, surround him with role players. You're guaranteed to be good. Whereas like I feel like Chet Holmgren is more of like you give him a star, a star like Shea, and he's gonna just exponentially build the value from there. I agree. Uh, these are the players I had above Zion. So these are players that I would take over Zion to build around. This first name, uh, it kind of iffy. I didn't know if I really wanted to put him over Zion, but let me know if you agree. LaMelo Ball. Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I think for me, I think it's tough because I, I think LaMelo has one big question mark that worries me, and it's the interior scoring. I think it improved this year, mm-hmm. but I feel like we see these uh, guards who aren't like physically strong. When they get into the playoffs, the lack of rim scoring really like down ticks their efficiency. I think Trey Young and Garland are two really good examples in recent years of like players who they get to the playoffs and it, like it just looks a little bit r- like they get roughed up a little bit. I think LaMelo has that issue, um, even though he's a lot taller. I think Lamelo's like, dude, his his playmaking though and his outside shooting. Yeah. I, I I almost feel like um Lamelo would kind of go into the group where I could see him being a number one, but I almost want him to be a complimentary to like if Brandon Miller takes that like Paul George type of leap. Um, so I think if I was building around, I think I would prefer Zion. Uh, but I definitely see the case for Lamelo because of that playmaking. I love that answer, Alperen Sengun. Ooh, another tough one because I think that's the that's the weird one with uh the defensive the defensive structuring. Like, how does it look building around Shangun? Uh-huh. Um, that's a weird one because I feel like uh with a non uh defensive center, I won't say Shangun's like this. A lot of people act like he's a just a traffic cone. He's been playing pretty good defense this year, and they're a top yeah. defensive team. So I don't want to take away from that. But I think it's like the Jokic thing where it's he clearly has exploitable issues. He's also not as big as Jokic. Um. And for me, it's it's he he has to develop the three ball because I think the way to mitigate a lack of a truly good defensive center is to have a four that you can play next to him and have him be a spacer. Like they use Jokic up top as a spacer because he's a threat to shoot. I think Shingun, if he adds that, it's kind of like the Sabonis thing too. Like how do you build around Sabonis? He can't shoot, so you can't put a defensive minded four next to him unless they're also can shoot. And so I think, uh, I think Shingun, there's a pathway to him becoming a better building piece than Zion, but I think it's a lot harder to find that piece. And Houston is hoping that Jabari Smith can be that yep. four that can yep. be versatile, versatile defensively can shoot 40% from three still wait around Jabari. I think Jabari is going to be good. And then these next three, it, it's pretty much like maybe consensus Tyrese Halliburton, Paulo and Anthony Edwards. I yeah, think at I, this point, probably over Zion. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I I do wonder, Um, I, I just think it's it's really weird with Zion because of the injury thing. I think that's where it's really like, like I feel like the, the envisionment I have for health for healthy Zion is just like such a, a crazy player, but it's almost like, does that even exist? Like, is that even realistic at this point? So I think that's where it becomes really tough in this discussion. Yeah, with Zion healthy, you can argue he's with, the top guys here. He's yeah. de- he definitely doesn't belong in the bottom half of this list. That's hundred uh, percent for sure. The stars that I had that I feel like are under talked about uh, Paulo Boncaro. Uh, the fact that Orlando, if I'm not mistaken, has had zero nationally televised games this year. <laughs> he's a first overall pick and he's averaging 23. He does it all. He rebounds, he play makes, and he has been the best pro on the magic and they're playing so well right now. And there's really no attention for, what he's doing yeah i really like paolo's game i wonder um my big thing with paolo is i i still like see a lot of decision making woes like uh i think he's pretty turnover prone he his shot selection can be questionable at times but i also on the other side wonder how much of that actually has to do with the way orlando structured and the way they run their lineups because if you look at paolo's like on off numbers i made a tweet about this recently um every player in the magic rotation has a worse net rating when Paolo's on the floor with them versus without. And it's like just the signal that suggests he's dragging them down. But when you really dive into the rotations and stuff, the magic run a, they, they take Paolo off the floor. They run like Franz and all of the starters with like, they'll put in Gary Harris, their best shooter. 
Um, and then they'll run that lineup. And then Paolo will come in with like this junkyard squ- squad of bench players. And it's like, um, he's, he's literally asked to do everything on the court for them. And, uh, he keeps them afloat. I, and in this recent stretch, like he's been elevating the efficiency is looking a lot better. Um, really good playmaker. And I feel like, uh, if I, I'm a little lower on Paolo in terms of just like raw value right now, but in terms of where he's going to be like in a couple of years, I don't know if I could possibly be higher. Like you can, every time you turn on a magic game, you just see it. Like you see where this guy's headed. Um, and yeah, if he figures out like that mid range jump shot, gets it up to like 45, 50%. Um, he's got elite foul drawing. He's physically really imposing. He's a versatile defender. Um, yeah, no, he, he's the real deal. That guy's, that guy's a hooper. The Orlando Magic's big three right now, it reminds me of the Celtics with Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smart. I feel like this current Magic team has that type of identity with Paolo and Franz, who Franz, if he gets consistent as a shooter, we're talking about him as one of the best wings in the NBA. And Jalen Suggs, the way he's revitalized his career uh, even though he, it just took some time to develop and he was injured a little bit. But the way that he's come along for this team, this is exactly what they expected and what they could have hoped for. He's been just so crucial to them defensively and pestering guards at the point of attack and pestering pick and roll actions. I, I just feel like Orlando, they're trending upwards. I don't know what that means for their playoff standing this year, if they're going to get out the first round or not. But this is one of the teams to be excited for. And if we didn't have a team in the West and OKC doing historic stuff at mm-hmm. such a young age. We'd be talking about Orlando as the rising young team in the NBA. 100%. And I don't know if you saw this tweet. A tweet went pretty big recently. It was uh, the top five teams in the West and the age of their starting lineup. And the magic was like 21, 22, 22, 21, 21. Wow. And it was like, like these guys are like, they don't play anyone that in their starting five. That's like, past their third year the fact that they're what 10 games above 500 they have i think the number four defense um yeah no this team is this seems serious i think uh they just need to like clean up on the margins a little bit get like maybe some more shooting that can also like be a starting level player and uh yeah no they're scary they're they're gonna be good the other star i had was alperen shangun Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Alperen Shangun. He reminds me a lot of Jokic, and I know that's a, a big comparison. He's baby Jokic. I, I feel like oftentimes we get lazy with comparisons, uh, and it's like, okay, Shangun, 6'11 European, Sabonis, 6'11 European, he's Sabonis. I don't think Shangun is really Sabonis. I, I When I look at Shangun, I'm not talking about his game from – a ceiling standpoint and where he could be, but just simply from a play style standpoint, I think he does look more like Jokic when he plays offensively playing through him from the post where Demonte Sabonis, most of his shot types are shots that are created for him versus Shangun. He's creating his own stuff. And I think the evolution in his game in the mid range, taking double the attempts he took from last year it's something that he's actively trying to improve at. And I think if he can improve that shooting long-term, then it really boosts his value and where he could be as a star. Yeah. What's really interesting to me about Shingun, I actually did a video on him this season, breaking down his game. And uh, what I really like about Shingun is um, obviously like he get, he got the Jokic comparison because of the passing. Like he's really flashy and creative passer, but I feel like when you watch Rockets games, he actually operates a lot closer to a guy like Embiid, like in the way, in like the way he picks his spots around the elbow, the way he faces up, the way he uh, like will throw a bunch of jab steps and then attack. Um, I feel like it's like a blend of, um, I definitely don't think he's going to be a Jokic level passer. Like I definitely don't think that, but a very good passer who operates like Embiid. So it's almost like a blend of the two. And uh, I think he's such a fascinating player. Like I remember at one point this season, I don't know if it's still that way, but he was setting the track, like since tracking started, he was setting the record for pick and roll points per game, like as a roller. And it's because not only is he a great screener and he can play in the mid range short roll, he can make those passes, but also he's really quick to get downhill and he can get above the rim. So he's like a very, he's a very good athlete. And I feel like people kind of overlook that when they do the Jokic comparison, like Shangun's way more above the rim, way quicker than Jokic is. And 
I guess my hot take would be, I think the peak version of Shen Goon um, is actually talked about more for his crafty scoring than his passing. I think right now people talk more about his passing, but I think, um, I think Shen Goon's best trait will be his scoring when he's at his peak. I love that. Shen Goon's post game is so refined right now. Yeah. And that's where, that's where like I kind of separated the Sabonis and Shen Goon comparison because I feel like Sabonis in the post, it's very much just trying to bully his way into it, getting close enough to the basket and then finishing around the rim. Where Shen Goon, the footwork he has is elite for his age and very advanced. And I think that's already a part of his offensive game that is elite. He's an elite post scorer where with Sabone is it's more so like rolling, cutting, putbacks, you know, getting offensive rebounds. With Shangun, it's more so he's self-creating his stuff, like I mentioned earlier. And I do think if the shooting comes along, we've seen him work on that one-legged fadeaway, sort of the, the knockoff Dirk fadeaway. It, it's gone in some games, it's very consistent, and he's using that shot. And I'm just hoping that he can improve that mid range because I feel like that is the missing piece to what you're talking about to becoming one of the better scorers in the league. Yeah, the thing with me for Sabonis is uh, I, I can't shake out of my head the way that I, I know people point to the Warriors like sagging off of him in the playoffs and making him just like non existent. But I think the worst thing was when he would post up, uh, they would only play his right shoulder, they would completely not play like they would angle themselves to let him, he could turn over his left and have a layup every time. And he's physically incapable of turning over his left shoulder. And I think that is just like, like when you, that's where the Shen Goon comparison starts and ends. Shen Goon would never be played to turn over a specific shoulder and have a layup. And then he can't do it. Like Shen Goon's way too crafty, way too robust of a scorer to get the Sabonis comparison. So that, yeah, I agree with that for sure.